Amen. You know, I, I'm pumped because this is the day that the Lord has made. And I and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. And uh, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm especially pumped right now because uh, my wife is usually at choir practice uh, on Thursday nights, but she relented this time only to actually suffer through her uh, husband's sermon. So Judy, if you would just stand. There's my Jude over there. I introduced her to Mike and he uh, looked at her and looked at me and he said, boy, she sure is a lot better looking than you are. <laughs> So, Mike, I feel the love. Thank you. Uh, I, I really am pumped uh, about tonight. Uh, I, I've been thinking about this. Perhaps I'm simply drawing some of the energy that uh, I began to pick up just two weeks ago, uh, speaking of Mike, with Mike's testimony. The wonder of our mighty God working in and through Mike. Praise his name. And then last week's testimony with John. I'm still stirred by what John challenged us with. And again, I give God all the praise for that. Amen. I'm pumped too because I'm now privileged to speak the word of God to me and to you. And to you as my family. Uh, I won't get all mushy here, but, but let me just tell you that uh, each of you, each of you over this past year has become a brother or a sister to me. Uh, certainly not because of anything I've done. Certainly not because of, frankly, anything that you've done, but solely, solely because of what our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has done in and through us to set all of us prisoners free from the death sentence of sin. Brothers and sisters, we are here unified by the Spirit in the bond of peace, Ephesians 4, 3, all, all under the lordship of King Jesus, to whom all praise is due. Do I get an amen? Amen. 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 All right. So I got to tell you, I'm pumped, and my wife knows when I get pumped, I can go long, but I'm not Manny Mill, okay? So I won't go long. Uh, I'll keep it to half an hour, and I know my wife will be back there going like this. Okay, cut it off. Uh, but again, I want to thank you for this privilege, and I want to thank especially Manny and Neff for allowing me to share the word and my heart with you tonight. And uh, also, while I'm up here, I, I really do want to uh, offer special thank yous to our friend Jim Whitmer uh, for insisting over a year ago that I check Manny Mill and RTO out. He was sort of like that drip, drip, drip. You know, every morning I'd get an email from Jim. You coming this Thursday? You coming this? Uh, no, no, I'm not. Finally, I thought, you know, Harold, you better just relent. You better go. Because if you don't, you'll get a thousand more emails from your brother, Jim Whitmer. So, of course, I relented, and guess what? I've been attending ever since. Truly, truly, this has been one of the best decisions of my entire life, for which I praise God. And I really wish I could do what Manny does. Hallelujah! Something like that. Anyways. Okay, that's the last imitation of Manny I'll ever try to do. Um, I, I also, though, uh, want to thank God for the way in which he has orchestrated tonight. It was interesting listening to our opening prayer. Because in the opening prayer, we touched upon the trials we all faced. And uh, also, I love this reference, the depths with which our God cares for us when we're going through our trials. And then as Neff was sharing those deep prayer burdens, I overheard somebody from the back say uh, something about God's timing. He's always on time. Amen. Trials, the depths of his caring, he's always on time. These are the very things that God had me prepare to talk about tonight. So he's running way ahead of me. So I'll be anxious to hear 
what he would have us learn tonight. Now to get us going, I'm going to try something a little bit different. I want to show a video. It's just a one minute video clip. And video is always tricky in an environment like this because sound can be muted, hard to hear. So uh, listen carefully. And again, it's just a one minute clip. But the reason I'm showing this is uh, when I saw it this week, uh, it, it really did play to what was stirring in my mind and heart about what I wanted to share with you today. So Jim, why don't we give it a go? How y'all doing? As you can see, I'm at the end of a haircut. My man Khalil is giving me a nice fade, and I bet you it looks really good because he's a real good barber, a real good artist. But I haven't seen it yet. But I trust that what he's done is a good job because he always has. You know, when God sends us through trials and he's shaping our life, a lot of times we can't see what he's doing. We don't understand what he's doing. But we have to trust that because he's always been faithful what he's doing is the right thing for us. So if you're going through something right now, God's giving you a life a haircut. Uh, just trust him. He knows exactly what he's doing. It looks really good. And one day you'll see uh, the benefits and the end product of what God's doing in your life. So I gotta go. He's gonna finish up here. See you later. That's my man, Miles McPherson. He's a former San Diego Charger and a Coke addict who now pastors the Rock Church in San Diego's California. And uh, by the way, Miles a Minute is his free app devotional. You can check it out. I would really uh, encourage you to do that. Uh, I wanted to start off with this particular minute reflection because it captures not only the topic of my message tonight, but the tension that I think we all feel behind this topic. My topic is dependence, okay? My topic is dependence. And the tension that we all feel behind our dependence is the level of confidence and trust that we have in the one we depend upon. Do you follow that? The tension we feel with our dependence invariably is the level of our confidence and trust in the one we depend upon. Now, as you saw in this video clip, my brother Miles is getting a haircut, and he's depending on his barber to do uh, the job that only he can do to make Miles look good. But as we just heard from Miles, he hasn't seen the finished product just yet. But Miles knows his barber. He has seen his barber's past work. He's seen it on himself. So Miles trusts his barber. He has confidence that the barber will do exactly what he told Miles he would do. Now think of all that uh, in, over the next minute or so. Isn't that like our great and awesome God? He is at work on each one of us right now, making us look good, if you will, or better yet, making us into new creations, 1 Corinthians 5.17. He is styling each one of our lives a little differently from all the rest. Now, of course, he's not using scissors or a razor, but he's using his spirit. He's using his word. And, uh, and usually this is the most uncomfortable part of his holy haircut on us. He's also using the ups and downs of our lives, the trials that we were praying about at the start of this meeting. Like Miles, we haven't seen what the outcome of God's creative cut on our lives will ultimately look like, but we can trust God. We can have confidence that God knows exactly what he's doing. We can depend on God even, even when the haircuts he's giving us feel more like severe buzz cuts. And brothers and sisters, I got to tell you something, and I won't be too personal here, but your family, so I can get into it. 
Uh, speaking of buzz cuts, I have to tell you that right about now it feels like God is giving me a very severe buzz cut. Let me explain. Over the past month, I have had to face multiple crises, multiple challenges, none of which, none of which I saw coming. One of those challenges was uh, a situation at work that basically uh, started out as a, a very unexpected budget shift. And uh, it doesn't sound uh, too dramatic, even with the red ink, and yet you have to understand that as the head of an organization with many lives tied to it, when I begin to see red ink, I grow in my concern. It hits me very personally because I know the decisions I make will impact many, many lives. But then beyond that, we're rolling out a new vision project. And as we are doing that, wouldn't you know that I would say Satan has attacked many of our families at Christianity Today with severe illness, with accidents, and in one case, with the murder of a family member. Needless to say, all of that has distracted us as a ministry and has deeply troubled me as the head of that ministry. It has rocked us. It has rocked us. I'm feeling the severe buzz cut of our God. But far more personally challenging than either of those has been the continuing concern my wife and I have for our dear oldest son, who 15 years ago decided to wander from the God of his youth. His choices have led him down a difficult path, and those poor choices have intensified over the past month. And Judy and I have exhausted ourselves praying for our boy, asking God to grab a hold of this dear one and grab a hold of him now. Now. Fifteen years later, though, and we're still waiting. Fifteen years later, and we're still waiting. We're still praying, and sometimes in the midst of our cries for help, sometimes in the midst of what feels like a severe buzz cut, we wonder what God is up to. We wonder how and when he will call our dear son back. We wonder how he will use this pain to shape us, to style us into the man and woman he wants us to become. And I pray into the man he wants our Andrew to become. Since we're family, since we're family, I know for a fact that many of you have had or are now experiencing, if you will, similar buzz cuts. And the question facing all of us in these times is, are we going to continue to trust God? Is our hope for today and tomorrow and all the tomorrows to come resting in the divine he, not the divine me? Amen? Even when we can't turn around and look into the mirror to see fully what God is doing, are we willing, unseen, to trust him? Are we willing to have confidence him, in him? The one who is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 1. Are we willing to totally depend on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? T tonight, I want to encourage all of us, I want to encourage me, to hold fast to our confidence and total dependence upon God by looking at a very familiar portion of Scripture and taking it, uh, and looking at it, and taking from it three words of assurance. Three truths that our great God has presented to us through his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that should encourage us. Three truths that we should meditate on so that we stay encouraged, so that in the trials of life, 
we don't lose sight of the fact that we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today, no matter what anyone else says, and he loves us with an everlasting love. And so with that, I want to read uh, John 11, 1 to 17. Now, it's an interesting portion of scripture. Like I said, it's one that we, we've all heard. But uh, usually we focus on the second half of this chapter, which we're not going to look at. One, because we don't have time. But the first half sets up some interesting dynamics between Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus and the one coming from Lazarus's hometown to tell him that Lazarus, his friend, is ill. There are three elements in these first 17 verses that I want to direct our attention to in the time that's remaining. So let me read this, and uh, you can read it uh, along with me. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, now listen to this, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, what would you have done when you heard that your best friend or a dear friend was ill, what would you have done? Hey, you probably would have gone. You'd have started checking, uh, you know, southwest.com. How can I get there? Okay, let's see what our Lord did. Uh, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. He stayed two days longer. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to J Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there. Now think about that. I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Four days. Interesting 17 verses. Let me throw out the three things that I take from this that I cling to when I'm experiencing those buzz cuts, when I'm beginning to find myself questioning whether or not God really knows what he's talking about. Three truths. The first truth, we serve a God who is all-powerful. Now, I know when I say that, that's, that's for most of us, maybe all of us, that's kind of a duh statement. It's like, come on, get real, Harold. We, we know God is all-powerful. Well, let me put it this way, brothers and sisters. I think that our head knowledge of God's limitless power and strength doesn't quite make it down to our hearts or into our spirits. Now, why do I say that? I say that because how many of us, when faced with trials, how many of us, with, when faced with challenges, do not necessarily meditate on the limitless power of our God. You probably do what I know I will do. I worry. I begin to worry, even though you and I know full well that the scriptures exhort us not 
to worry. Do not be anxious about anything, Paul writes in Philippians 4, 6. And then uh, an interesting verse in Proverbs 29, 35, we're told that the fear of man, the worry of man, lays a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And yet, and yet still we worry. Now you know as well as I, that doesn't accomplish much of anything. But actually more concerning for me when I begin to worry is in reality, it casts doubts on my belief that God is all powerful. If I'm worrying, what does that say about the strength of my belief that God is all powerful? Think about that. Think about that. And that's the reason why that verse in Proverbs about fear being a snare. It says that because without God, all we have left is us. Is us. And that's a weak and worrisome position to be in. And frankly, the people in this story that Jesus is interacting with are weak. Now, why do I say that? Perhaps you noticed as you were reading how many times in the opening verses of chapter 11 uh, that the Apostle John, who is the author of this gospel, mentions that Lazarus is ill. Jim, do we have that slide uh, with the emphasis? Let's look at that. Look at that. Ill, 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 illness, ill. Now, I'm, I'm an editor. If somebody writes like that, I, I know that either he needs an editor or he's making a point, okay? John, as inspired by the Spirit of God, is making a profound point. He's making it very clear that uh, this man, through whom the glory of God will be shown, is down for the count. He is totally helpless to the point of death. He is totally helpless. He is not strong. He's not fit or healthy. He is deathly ill. This is an impossible situation for Lazarus, to be sure, but also for Mary and Martha, also for all of the friends who are in Bethany waiting for something to happen and realizing there's nothing that they themselves can do. This is an impossible situation for everyone. Everyone is powerless. John is pounding that theme in these verses. Everyone is powerless except except the God of creation. You know, reflect upon that. There's no financial challenge too high, no family crisis too deep, no sickness, no legal matter too wide that the scope of God's mighty hand cannot reach it, cannot draw it to himself, cannot shape it into a work of new creation. For from him and to him and through him are all things, all things. Whatever you're dealing with, all things. Amen. What is impossible, what is impossible with people is possible with God, Luke 18, 27. And so, and so my dear brothers and sisters, we can be confident that God can and is working through whatever your condition is tonight. Whatever your condition will be tomorrow and for every tomorrow to come. Whatever the situation is, he is all powerful. I love this quote by David Platt from his book, Taking Back Your Life. God delights in using Christians who come to the end of themselves and choose to trust in his ex extraordinary provision. He stands ready to allocate his power to all who are radically dependent upon him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
That's important for all of us to remember. It's not only when everything's going well that we're going to be used by God. No, wherever we find ourselves, God can and will work through those who know and love him. Whatever it is, whatever it is, we can depend totally, wholly, upon God's mighty power. Let me show you Ephesians 1, 19 to 21, a wonderfully encouraging verse for all of us. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He is all-powerful. We can depend on him wholly and totally till the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm, I, I can see my wife is saying, keep it moving, Harold. So we're going to keep it moving. We've got two more truths that I do want to throw out at you. So truth number one is we serve a God of limitless power. Truth number two, we serve a God who is all loving. We serve a God who has limitless, limitless love. Again, early in the passage, uh, and actually, I'm going to cheat a little here. It's not only in the first 17 verses, but if you read the entire chapter, we see a uh, number of times over, several times over, that, that uh, it is mentioned that Jesus loves Mary, Martha, Lazarus. And then, of course, in Bethany, when he weeps, verse 35, remember what the people said? See how he loved him. See how he loved him. Well, brothers and sisters, let me tell you, this is so obvious. We've been singing about it since we were kids. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Amen and amen. But I got to tell you, just like uh, we lose sight in our worry to his power, there are those times that we are going through troubles that I have to tell you, I think I, I think we all at times question whether or not God truly loves us. You've heard it before, I hear it. Wait a minute, if, if God is a God of love, why? Why? Why do I feel this? Brothers and sisters, our emotions, when we're going through deep water, can play amazing tricks on us. So much so that Satan sees this as a playground. He, and he can grab a hold of us. And he can start delivering doubt after doubt after doubt. Not only doubting God's limitless power, but doubting God's limitless love. I, 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 I look at it this way. I introduced you to my beautiful bride, Judy. Judy and I have been married for 40 years. 40 years. 40 of the best. <laughs> 40 of the best years of my life, and probably five or six of the best years of her life. <laughs> now, <laughs> stop shaking your head, yes, honey, please. Uh, now, now, there have been times, there have been times over the course of our marriage, rare by God's grace. But there have been times when uh, we probably don't feel the love between each other for whatever reason. I praise God that at those rare times, we don't rely upon our emotions. Instead, I know Judy. I know what she has done time and time again for me over those four decades. Even when I have been my most unlovely, my most unlovable, my most unloving, Judy is there and has consistently, lovingly cared for me. 
I reflect on that. And I realize my emotions are lying. Now, let's imagine God's great love for us. His love, his caring are much, 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 much greater. For I am sure, writes the Apostle Paul in Romans 8.38, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. And you can read into that your own troubles that we experience day in and day out. Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In his new book, Loving Jesus More, Wheaton College president Phil Riken puts it this way. He, Jesus, loved by serving. He loved by teaching. He loved by healing and forgiving. Most of all, he loved us by dying on the cross for our sins. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, not a day goes by that I don't rehearse daily, daily, Romans 5 8. For God demonstrated his love for us in this for while we were yet sinners, sinners Christ died for us. Christ died for me. For me. Think about that. That's not emotion. That's the truth. That truth will carry us into eternity, everlasting life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would we cling to that? So I have a question for you, brothers and sisters, on this second truth. And uh, really, it's one that uh, President Riken opposes in his book. Do you know, do you know that God loves you? Not minimally, but maximally. Do you believe that Jesus walked this earth as much for you, as much to demonstrate his love for you, as for anyone else? Brothers and sisters, let me say, if you are experiencing doubt on that, then reread the gospel story and we read it again, and we read it again, and we read it, and we read it, and we read it again. Ask that the Spirit of God penetrate your mind and heart, penetrate your spirit with the reality of our dear Lord's limitless love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we serve a God who is all-powerful and all-loving. But there's a third reason found in these verses that prompts us to trust God and depend upon him more. And that truth is this. We serve a God whose timing is perfect. So whoever yelled that out, that's my third point. We serve a God whose timing is perfect. You know, I was challenged by this thought in a sermon that I heard actually off of this passage this summer in a church in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. And when the pastor finished, I, I have been mulling this through uh, since then and reflecting on the fact that God does indeed have all the time in the world. And uh, while I see that as one of the most hope-filled reasons for my dependence on God, I mean, after all, let's think about this. We are to be on his schedule, not ours, his schedule. That's pretty freeing. That's, that's pretty freeing. Nevertheless, I also think that this truth may well be one of the most complicated, if not the most complicated element of our dependence upon God. Now, why do I say that? Because, brothers and sisters, in case you haven't noticed, we are all naturally impatient. Our lives are timed right to the minute. We are slaves to our smartphones. 
or if you're technologically, uh, a, you're a technological holdout, you're slaves to your calendar. We live in a very impatient world. We hate to wait. If I want something, I usually want it now. If I'm sick, I want to get better now. If something needs to be done, I want it done now. And you know, here's the weird thing and the sad thing about our impatience. It filters over into our relationship with God. You can't be impatient over here and patient over here with God. You can't. That's false. You're either patient or impatient. So what happens when we're impatient in our relationship with God? Well, we want him to act now. I don't want to wait 15 years for my dear Andrew to come back. I want him to come back now. We pray many times for our convenience. What's best for us, or so we think. We forget, we lose sight of God's glory, of what God wants to accomplish for his glory when you and I suffer heartache. In this chapter, Jesus is told that Lazarus is dying. But interestingly enough, he doesn't leave for Lazarus' hometown for another two days. And we know later on in this chapter, both Mary and Martha say the same things. Lord! I'm paraphrasing this now. This is the Smith translation. Lord, why didn't you come faster? Why didn't you come sooner? Why didn't you answer our petition now? God says, no. Jesus said, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait two days. And then, of course, we know that when he finally arrives, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. So what's with Jesus? Why is he doing this? Why is he so slow? Why hasn't he answered my prayer right now? Well, as I said, that's Mary and Martha's question. And that many times is our question as well. But Jesus, in this passage, sets the record straight. Let me look at these two verses. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. So that the Son of God may be glorified through it. We have our plans. Mary and Martha had their plans. Get them well now. But Jesus said, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. There's a greater plan. There's a plan I want you to see. And it's, it, it's giving glory to God. And then, of course, the other thing that I, I, I take so warmly here is Jesus knows the situation inside and out. He knows this illness does not lead to death. He knows resurrection is around the corner. But then Jesus also knows when Lazarus has died. He knows everything. Nothing that happens to us takes him by surprise. He knows. And not only does he know, but then his plan in helping us walk through the heartaches the trials, the difficulties, the challenges. When he leads us, he does it so that I'm satisfied? No. No. So that God is given the glory. So that God is given the glory. Brothers and sisters, I pray that we can remember that the next time we are wrestling with trials. Here's one for you. This is always a stunner for me when I think about this. 2 Corinthians 3.3, the Apostle Paul, and I love this because, again, I'm in editorial. We do magazines and websites and stuff like that. The Apostle Paul encourages believers to be letters from Christ. Do you know you're a letter? He wants you to be a love letter. And uh, you think, wait a minute, what are you talking about? I'm not a letter. I'm not paper. 
I'm not pixels. Uh, what do you mean I'm a love letter? Well, you're a love letter because the intention here is that people will read your life. And when they read your life, especially your life going through heartache, they will begin to see the God who has limitless power. They will begin to see the God who has limitless love. And they will begin to see the God whose timing is absolutely perfect. Instead of hearing us complain, they'll read about that God. And perhaps, by the Spirit's leading, be drawn to saving faith. Let me quickly tell a story before I close. I, I was very privileged to be raised by two very dynamic uh, Christian people. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you notice, I, I get kind of pumped. Uh, well, my mom and dad out-pumped me right up until the day they died, okay? You go to the Smith house and it was like, brace, brace yourself. There was not a person who darkened the door of the Smith house, and it could be the, mail, the mailman, the, the, the newspaper guy, whatever, without mom or dad telling them the good news about Jesus Christ. They were pumped. Well, for uh, the better part of 16 years, the last 16 years of my mother's life, and she died in 2012, uh, she suffered from breast cancer. Half of that time, stage four, breast cancer. Now think about that. Her doctors would consistently say to her, Dorothy, you're a miracle. What's this all about? And of course for my mother it was just another opportunity to give praise to God. If you knew my mother, and I am not, you know sometimes we like to embellish things, uh, especially those who have gone on to be with the Lord, but I think my wife will attest to this, my mother never complained. She just never complained. She always say, why? Look who we serve. If this is what he wants me to go through, then so be it. And she lived those eight years at stage four that way. Now, my mom was the size of a hobbit. I don't know if you know what a hobbit is, you know, Lord of the Rings. She was about four foot, four foot five. And uh, she would always get big dogs. And we'd always laugh because it's like, Mom, you can ride this dog. So every, every evening, she would walk the dog around the neighborhood. And, uh, and periodically, you know, people were out there. She'd always talk to people, just like my father, who had died 10 years earlier. And uh, so, you know, Mom's reputation in the neighborhood was fairly well known. And uh, anyway, one night, one night after she walked the dog, it's about 10.30 at night. There was a knock on the door. Now, my mom was living alone. There was a knock on the door. And there was, and mom gets up. My mom never locked the door. It drove me nuts. And she went to the door, and there was a woman there. And my mom didn't recognize her. But my mom being my mom, well, hello, what can I do for you? And she said, are you Dorothy Smith? My mom goes, yeah. Are you, you're that woman who walks the big dog. Yeah. I've heard about you from other neighbors. And she pauses. She says, I need to talk to you. I want to kill myself. My mom looked at her. And of course, if you knew my mom, she, there was never a door closed. So she welcomed this woman into her house. For the next two hours, mom shared with her the powerful, all-loving story of our Lord and Savior. Now, I wish I could say that she accepted our Lord at that night. She did not. But she looked at my mother. She said, I've got to think about this. Thank you. Thank you. I am deeply encouraged. There is some degree. Of, I think there's truth here. What that woman was doing was reading the letter of my mother's life. And what she was reading was Jesus Christ. Was Jesus Christ. I pray to God that that woman went home 
knelt down and accepted her Lord. But Father, but, but, but brothers and sisters, let me just say this. We need to be living a life of faith in the God who is all-powerful, all-loving, and whose timing is perfect. Now, I do want to just show one other verse. I think we have one other verse. Because I really love this verse. Um, you know, Doubting Thomas, this is sort of a, some people look at this as almost, is a very complicated verse because it's hard to really know, especially in the Greek, what, what exactly is going on here. But so Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. People don't know whether or not this was like, oh boy, this is great. We're going to Judea, we're going to die, so we might as well just die. You know, Thomas being really optimistic. But, uh, or was this simply an expression of small faith, but nevertheless faith? And I, I want to close focusing on this to simply say sometimes we have just enough faith. And that's okay. As long as we remain open to having God grow our faith, as he demonstrates his power and love and perfect timing in our lives. You know, later on in this chapter, Jesus says something very profound to Mary uh, before he raised Lazarus from the dead. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? We need to remember that every single day, whatever it is you are going through. So with that, my brothers and sisters, I want to thank you for the privilege of sharing these truths with you. And let me close with this quote, and then I have one other video clip, and then nephew can come out. A devotional writer Jacques Philippe says this in a very interesting book called Interior Freedom. The most important thing in our lives is not so much what we can do as leaving room for what God can do. The great secret of spiritual fruitfulness and growth is learning to let God we can only do that if we anchor in his limitless power, if we anchor in his limited, limitless love, and if we trust that his timing is perfect. To the glory of God. Amen. Tim, we have one other video to close it up. You know the best part of a haircut is when you get the mirror and you get to look at the back of your head <laughs> and see if it all looks good, and it does, as usual. You know, there's sometimes in your life you just need to stop, step back, and look at what God has done in your life. Think back to how you were and how you are today. Hopefully it's a big change. And think of all the, not only the blessings that you have, but how much you have changed and how much you have grown in your relationship with God and your dependence in God and, and uh, things you don't do anymore that you used to do. And just take a step back and appreciate the change that God's brought in your life because it's, you're never going to get there perfectly until you get to heaven, but it's the process that you need to acknowledge, you need to enjoy, and you need to understand that you're in a process that will last until the day you die. So take a minute, get a mirror out, look at the cut God's doing on your life, and just enjoy the progress in your faith and in your relationship with God. Good job, my man. <laughs>